Between mid-June and mid-September 2012, without police knowing, a gang of heavy Turkish criminals rapidly took over Tilburg and Rotterdam. On June 22, 2012, police in Tilburg responded to an incident. A Turkish drug criminal named Murat K was shot at and barely survived the attack. He allegedly ruined a deal and had to pay the price. Still recovering from the incident, Murat's wife was approached by a man who had a message for Murat. The man warned him threateningly not to talk to the police. That warning was unnecessary. Murat knew better than to go and talk to the police as he was already terrified enough. On July 6th, just a few weeks later, a shooting took place in Hall that again involved a Turkish man. He had allegedly ruined a cannabis plantation in Leylistat. When a man named Ibrahim I opened the door of his house that evening, an armed man stood opposite him. They immediately got into a fight, which resulted in Ibrahim being shot by the man. The gunman ran away, leaving Ibrahim wounded. The terrified Ibrahim told police officers that the gunman belonged to a serious criminal group. He mentioned the name Sahin and described the gang. Ibrahim also talked about a man in a wheelchair, a man that was deemed to be ruthless and unforgiving. Ibrahim pointed to him as being the undisputed leader in the Netherlands of the Sahin gang, who is always heavily guarded. They can easily eliminate us. I know that talking will cost us our head. Their group is responsible for much more incidents no one knows of, Ibrahim said. At last, Ibrahim finally gave a name of the man in the wheelchair. It was none other than Zekaria K, the leader of the ruthless division of the Sahin gang in the Netherlands, also known as the Master. Who was this man? And what had he got to do with the shootings? After Ibrahim's first confession, gradually more Turks started speaking to the police about this Zekaria K, and he gained an almost mythical status. They all somewhat said the same. They respected him, yet feared him. And most importantly, they wish they never knew who he was. Keep in mind, the police heard about the name Zekeria K here and there for years, but still had no idea who he was. All this information was new to them. He has always done a very good job of staying under the radar and keeping a low profile. Besides it being known that he was born in 1971, there's no information to be found about his early life, his upbringing, and what made him become the man he was. There's also only one picture of him in circulation. Interesting to note is that he was left paralyzed in a wheelchair due to a shot by a member of the rival Saral group. After the two shootings mentioned in the beginning of this video, there was another attempted hit in Tilburg. This time, the target was a man named Mustafa G. On the 11th of September 2012, at around 1 a.m., he was struck multiple times on the Kapelmeisterlan in Tilburg. Despite being struck in his head, Mustafa managed to drag himself to the apartment door after which people immediately called emergency services. Mustafa remained in a coma for weeks, but miraculously survived the incident. This ruthless incident was the reason for the Tilburg Detective Department to set up a large-scale investigation team that worked on the operation they named Kapel. This name derived from the last shooting which happened on the Kapelmeisterlan. The police were alarmed by more incoming signals from the Turkish-Dutch underworld about Zekeria and his men and decided it was time to take significant action. The Turkish underworld remained very closed and tight-lipped, making it incredibly hard for police to book any progress. No one wanted to talk out of fear of repercussions. It was best for everyone to turn a blind eye to what was happening, because if you'd make Zekeria mad, you knew you would be next in line. The previous three incidents were prime examples of that. Step by step, police managed to gather some information here and there and pieced it together. As the puzzle of Zekeria became larger, police slowly gained a better understanding of him. They were in awe of his stature and alleged involvement in the underworld. They found out that Zekeria is the cousin of Sadat Sahin. The latter is the head of an international Turkish criminal organization that operates from Turkey. The Sahin group was the overarching organization active in multiple countries, and Zekeria's group was the Dutch division of this organization. Nothing happened in Tilburg without the knowledge of Zekeria and thus Sadat as well. They further found out that the group around Zekaria was claiming a monopoly in drug trafficking, gambling, and violence in mainly Tilburg, as well as the rest of the Netherlands, by all means necessary. Several of the established Turkish crime organizations in Tilburg literally fled the city because of him. They were terrified, because they knew he could call on the powerful Sahin group for help. The Sahin family name made everyone tremble with fear. Allegedly, they also had very strong ties in Turkey leading directly to Prime Minister Erdogan. In a tapped conversation from Zekeria, he talked to an unknown person about the number of members of the organization who were imprisoned in different countries. 
the man on the other end of the line said he could introduce Zekeriya and Sadat to an advisor of the Turkish Prime Minister. The unknown person explained that the Prime Minister thinks that Mafia boss Sadat is a nice man. Sadat had previously been described by Turkish media as a man with convenient contacts with the police, judiciary, and politicians. All in all, it seemed as if they agreed to see what they could do about the imprisoned members. The Turkish criminals who spoke in secret with the police stated that there was a serious threat here. Extracts from files described that some interviewees said, all alarm bells should ring for Zekeriya, and police seriously need to go after him before he gets too big. Those files further stated that it appeared that Zekeriya led a group of 10 men. They were all of Turkish descent, aged between 23 and 48. Some were born in Turkey, others in the Netherlands. All 10 men had serious crimes on their record. One of them, like leader Zekeriya, was previously convicted of a hit. Zekeriya served a sentence of 11 years for his hit. While Turkish organizations were most known for their heroin trade, these times were long gone. Zekeriya expanded his business and focused on a multitude of substances to sell. Weed had become the core business, as well as ecstasy. His organization would rake in serious cash, selling immense amounts all over the world. Sometimes shipments went wrong though. Zakaria is linked to two seizures of ecstasy after an associate of his was caught with 35 kilos of ecstasy in a suitcase at Zaventem Airport in Belgium in November 2011. Another associate was arrested with another suitcase full of pills in Istanbul on the same day. By now we know Zakaria was not a person you wanted to play with. While most people walked on eggshells around him, a man named Ramazan G did not. During an argument about money, Ramazan heavily insulted Zakaria which led to a conflict between them. Zekeriya, as relentless as he was, immediately thought about teaching Ramazan a lesson. He allegedly set up a plan to have Ramazan humiliated in Istanbul. He ordered some of his associates in Istanbul to treat Ramazan like a woman. The plan was to kidnap Ramazan, put lipstick on him, have him put on a miniskirt, and leave him somewhere in the busy city center of Istanbul as the ultimate form of humiliation. I have to say this is quite creative and something I've never seen before in all my time of making these videos. Whether this actually happened is not clear. The fact that he even thought about it is already crazy enough though. In October 2013, after tapping and hearing numerous victims and suspects, the police thought they had enough information to arrest the group around Zekeriya K. They simply did not want to wait any longer because the risk of more violence was very high and had to be prevented. Zekeriya frequently moved between Tilburg and Antwerp after a joint effort of Belgian and Dutch police, he was arrested in Antwerp carrying a loaded firearm. Nine other of his associates were arrested across Belgium and the Netherlands, of which nearly all of them were also carrying a firearm. In May 2017, Zekeria heard that prosecutors demanded a 20-year jail sentence for him. He was deemed to be the boss of a criminal organization that imported and exported various sorts of substances, as well as the initiator behind the three failed hits that happened. His lawyer, Louis de Leon, said that his client's role has been made too big by the police and judiciary. He is involved because of his past. My client played no role in the shootings. Others only reached out to him because he could mediate. By actually solving things, he got into trouble. That was all to no avail, as he was sentenced to serve 19 and a half years in jail several months later in September 2017. They found him guilty on all charges the prosecutors accused him of, but spared him half a year. Zekeria did ultimately admit to selling substances, but always denied all allegations of being involved in any hits. For now, he is serving his prison sentence and will be behind bars for a very long time. His arrest meant that the once established crime groups in Tilburg that fled because of him could return to the city and conduct business again without having to fear repercussions from Zekeria. I'm curious to know what you think about Zekeria and the Turkish Mafia. It seems quite different from the Mako Mafia that I've already covered in many videos. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. See you in the next one.